Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Are you ready to get back in our Father's Word? The 22nd chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs gives you a, um, it's a book of comparisons, letting you compare the good with the bad. Now, today we still have a kind of a list of the two liners, but when we get down to the 17th verse, Wisdom begins to speak, and you sure want to listen to her, okay? She's, she'll bring you on through some pretty tough times if you listen to wisdom. She'll show you the way. She'll always take care of you. It, th again, we're still in, a cha in the chapters that have to do with personal character. It tells you how to build your character. You can either take it to the, to the bad or to the good. That's what Proverbs is about is helping you make your mind up. So having said that, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Chapter 22, verse 1, Proverbs, and it reads, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. That means, loving favor means uh, grace, compassion, but, and a good name also. Why, why is it better than riches? Well, if you have a good name, and you protect it and you use it, it'll bring you riches from God's blessings. And I'm speaking monetarily also. Uh, God loves His children and He expects His children to have what is necessary. And certainly uh, a good name. You know, your name is so valuable. It, um, it, it will take you and open many doors for you as long as you protect it and if you give your word on something, you hang tough, you keep it, okay? Uh, let your word be your bond and contract, all right? And, and as long as you know it was done in good conscience and you're able to do that. But um, because, why? well, if you have a good name and you have favor, riches will come to you. If you don't have a good name and you don't have favor, I don't care if you do have riches, you're going to lose them, okay? You're not going to be able to hang on to them. You'll lose them one way or the other. Why? You'll be minus God's blessings. Verse 2. The rich and poor, that's the, this word in the Hebrew means the needy, meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. In other words, they are all God's children. And, and many people think it's a, a shame to be rich. Don't ever... Don't ever if it's rich with God's blessings, that is God's blessings. To be rich with ill-gotten gains is a different ball game, okay? That, why? That's not going to do you any good. But to be rich with God's blessings, uh, that's fantastic. But the poor and the rich both um, uh, meet together, and God is the maker of them all, and God blesses them all that love Him, that follow Him. Three, a prudent man foreseeth the evil. Prudent is a man who cautiously practices common sense, okay, and hideth himself. Uh, why? He knows how to by step uh, that that is evil, how to get around it, over it, or go through it, okay. But he plans ahead, and he's got it made. But the simple pass on and are punished. The unsuspecting never know. They just walk right into it without any planning, without any backing or anything else, just walk blindly into evil. Why? They're blind. They can't see. They're unsuspecting. But one that cautiously utilizes common sense can spot wickedness and evilness coming, trouble. And they know how to take care of it. Verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord, that's to say to love Him, revere Him, or riches and honor and life. And why? Because it's God's blessings. It brings God's blessings to you. And, and God loves you for that. God is aware of what His children do. 
That's why he has the book of life. And that's why he takes care of it. He protects it. He keeps it. Okay. And um, humility and love for God will always play. Why? It's our, our riches. Why? Well, he, he'll bless you rich. Okay. When you utilize common sense and uh, practice it. Verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. That's to say a crook. Any way a crook goes forward, he's got thorns. There's stuff waiting for him there. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. In other words, one that protects his eternal soul and does right and loves God is, is far from, um, from the snares and that that happens. What, well, what kind of snares are we talking about? Well, law enforcement, for one thing. If you're a crook, uh, we have a lot of built-in snares for you. We're going to get you. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the whole ball game, is to take the wicked off the streets and lock them away, okay, or convert them uh, with a, a lot of hard work and change of mind, and that'll get it done, okay. But um, a, a crook, a lot of people think, well, uh, you know, in some of your big towns where you've got a drug pusher drives a big, shiny car, don't worry, we're going to pick it up. The government's going to own the car. We're going to empty his pockets, and we're going to salt him away. Uh, that, that's that's uh, uh, only an idiot would do something like that. When you can have riches that you can hold dear and near and bless your family with it, okay? Which, if nothing else, you know what's one of the richest things there is? Is peace of mind. If you have peace of mind, then you sleep good at night, and, and you're comfortable. Verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I like to translate that. He won't even want to depart from it. If, if you train a child up in the way of the Lord, he knows where those blessings come from. And he counts them. And um, certainly his desire will not be to go against God because he knows what that brings. And it is true. Uh, and this is why that discipline and training are such wonderful things. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, and uh, I thank God for that. And that's why His blessings come forth to those that love Him. Uh, never, never correct a child when you're angry. And always talk to a child and make sure they understand why you do things that you do uh, even in correction. But um, leading in the way of the Lord, that brings peace to their minds also. Verse 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. This is why you don't ever want to get severely in debt. Okay? Because you're, you're in bondage. Okay? You're absolutely in bondage. And whatever you do, don't ever borrow money on a credit card. Okay, That's what we have banks for, is to borrow money from a bank. The insurance, uh, the interest rate in comparison is, um, is uh, awesome. And um, always pay your credit. It's all right to use a credit card, but make sure you pay it each month. And... and um, because they will up the interest on you until it's, you really get yourself in a bind. And you're nothing but a slave. That's why God's Word always says, stay out of usury as best you can. It is true that to buy a home, a farm, uh, or a business, uh, there's nothing wrong with borrowing money to make money. Okay, But um, when on frivolous things, if you can't afford it, you don't need it. Okay. You wait till you can pay payments to yourself and buy it, okay? Verse 8, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. That's to say calamity, okay? And the rod of his anger shall fail. Everything he touches shall fail, okay? In other words, what you sow is what you're going to reap. If you sow trouble, you're going to reap trouble. If you sow sorrow, you're going to reap sorrow. What you want to do is sow truth, sow God's Word, plant seeds of truth, and you'll always be blessed. 
it, there, does that mean I'll just will live in a rose garden? The rest? No, you'll have trouble, but God lets you know how to handle it. Okay, He'll never load you up with more than you can handle. All right, that's His promise. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirteen. Verse 9, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. And again, this word poor in the Hebrew means handicapped, okay? It doesn't mean, um, that's exactly what it means. One that has plenty and has a bountiful eye, he's going to be blessed, for he giveth what? He takes care, he does his part in taking care of handicapped people, all right? Uh, verse 10, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out, yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Now this loses a little in the translation. This scorner means a scorner of God. Okay. Somebody in your midst that will scoff at anything that someone says in a religious sense of our Father, and really is scoffing at Almighty God Himself. You do not want to, you don't want someone like that in your midst that makes light of God's word or the truth. What it's saying, get rid of them, cast them out. You don't need them, you don't want them. Okay. They're nothing but trouble, doubters going somewhere to happen. And you certainly don't want it in your midst. Why? You, you, don't, you have to have a, a, um, a, a sense of rest and common sense and peace of mind in a group so that they can grow together and study together. And certainly a scorner upsets everything that a group uh, begins to do. And, and if there is a weak person, it can cause doubts even about God in that weak person's mind. Verse 11, he that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. In other words, um, uh, he's going to um, uh, the pureness and the truth of his mind and his heart, where he lives it, he speaks it. Certainly, that uh, people draw that draws attention to one that you can count on them. They're solid. They're a good citizen, good to be around, and helpful, and an asset to the community. Um, verse twelve: The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. And the overthrower, and he rather overthroweth the words of the transgressor. He confuses the words. In other words, with integrity and courtesy, as from the prior verse, uh, uh, love of pureness. That's that's courtesy, that's integrity, and that brings forth the um, uh, the real truth, the real message. But the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. He confuses him, doesn't bless him, and will put him right out of business. Okay. And, and is it not strange how that someone that, that uh, is a doubter always complains that nothing good happens to them? Well, it's no wonder. They, don't, they do not have the blessings of God. Verse 13, the slothful man, this is to say a lazy person, a lazy man, uh, saith, there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. In other words, he always makes up an excuse for why he can't go find a job. Always making excuses for himself. And uh, it's too dangerous out there today, I'll go tomorrow. But as you know, tomorrow never comes. This is why God comes down pretty good on a lazy person. And again, I want to reemphasize, because I get many letters, this is not talking about handicapped people that are unable to work. Okay? Um, that's why that we had um, uh, verse 9, the, to take care of the handicapped. Okay? Uh, verse 14, the mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Now, again, here, this word woman is zur. Okay, the word strange is zur, meaning it's an apostate. It's one that claims to be a Christian, claims to be of you, but isn't. Okay, 
big, has big swelling religious words that they can lay on you, but they go. They have sold the true servant uh, service of God for the traditions of man that make void the word of God, and they are a danger and they open a pit and many people fall in it. This is why, example, rapture theory, rapture doctrine. You beware, my friend. There are many false teachers have entered into the world, and Jesus warned us of this over and over. The first thing he would say in Mark 13 concerning the end times, uh, many will come in my name. In other words, many are gonna come claiming to be Christian preachers and, uh, and um, Christians, period lay persons that plant seeds that are traditions of men, not God's word, not factual. So a zur is, that is to say an apostate, one that claims to be a Christian can do a lot of damage if, um, if not attended to. Well, what do you mean by attended to? Put in place, taught properly. Verse 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And, and, and this is true. A child must always grow up. A child must learn. And naturally, um, the rod of correction is discipline in a family. And as I said earlier, um, never, never punish a child when you're angry. Okay. Do not do that. Just break yourself. If you're in the habit of that, just stop it. Okay. Wait until you... Take a little walk, take a deep breath or two, and think about it, pray a moment, and then explain to that child why you must correct them. Explain to them what they did that brings this uh, correction forth, okay? Because they're very intelligent, and this is the way they learn. If they don't know why you're punishing them, well, what, that's going to confuse them and they're simply going to, to uh, through confusion, let it um, uh, even affect their attitude. And that's not right. Children are very intelligent. They're in the process of growing into, to, I mean, adult beings. And, um, and you want to train them well. And, and as we had a verse prior, bring them up in the way of the Lord. And even in old age, they'll never depart from it. They won't want to because of God's blessings, okay? But, um, but don't be disappointed, children have to learn, okay? That's, that's just life itself. And if you think back, you were there at one time, okay? 16, he that oppresseth the poor, now here again, this word poor is handicapped, okay? A little bit weak, a weak one. Uh, to increase his riches, I'll read it again. He that oppresses the, oppresseth the handicap to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Okay, so um, you you know this is one of the things that you, if you are on a fixed income and you're handicapped, and I, I read a letter from a person in the last lecture or so that was on a fixed income. And this preacher told him if he didn't send money that God wouldn't answer his prayers, you know. And this is not true. We're supposed to help the handicapped, okay? And when our government, through Medicare, Medicaid, and what have you, when, when uh, they assist a handicapped person, Certainly, you don't need a bunch of preachers standing around trying to beat them out of what little they have to pay for medicine and food, okay? It won't fly, and God won't bless it. And just make them friends and influencing people here, okay? But I, I really, um, I feel that uh, people, uh, when, when senior citizens are on fixed incomes or, and are in and approaching the end of life and they're thinking about heaven bound, then sometimes these preachers can take advantage of that being so-called man of God or men of God, and they're really not. Okay. Not when they oppress people. And if you ever need a real proof of it, we just read it, verse 16. Okay, as I told you, when we come to this 17th chapter, I'm sorry, the 17th verse, we have about 30 sayings of the wise. So you want to hear wisdom? 
Then here it goes. Listen to wisdom. Verse 17. Bow down thine ear. That means you open it up and hear the words of the wise. You listen carefully. And apply thine heart, that's to say your mind, unto my knowledge. Wisdom speaks. Listen to her. 18. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, that they shall withal be fitted in thy lips. In other words, listen to wisdom and stow it away in your mind, whereby when you can share and plant a seed or a thought, your lips can speak that wisdom then and be a blessing to others. Okay, That's wisdom. And let wisdom speak, all right? And let's go with the next verse, verse 19. They that trust may be in the, they, I'm sorry, that they trust, that thy trust, rather, may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. And, and so it is. 20, have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? Of course he has. We're reading it. Okay. The, the entire word of God is counsel to you. And do you know something? It's free. It's for you to absorb and to gain that knowledge and tuck it away. It's precious. It's very precious. Okay. 21. That I might make thee known, um, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. In other words, if someone ask you a question for guidance, for leadance, for to be led. You've got it tucked away up here. What? The wisdom of God. And you know something? It always pays dividends. God loves you for that. And God will bless you for that. Why? Because they're all His children. And if they need truth and knowledge and you give it to them, then God blesses you, you see because he wants that word to go forth. This is why it makes his day when you listen to his wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? Again, I want to remind you, chapter one, verse seven of this same book, Proverbs. Wisdom in the beginning of knowledge is to revere or to love or fear Almighty God, okay? And um, uh, planting seeds is a beautiful thing. When you have the knowledge stored, in your mind that you can assist others with that truth, that excellency of our Heavenly Father. 22, rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. That's to say, especially the beggar down at the gate. Don't, don't take advantage of poor people. Don't ride it over them if you've been blessed. Um, just following that verse 21 where you're supposed to be a blessing, what kind of would that be for you then to oppress the poor? 23, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Uh, the Lord will take their part. This is why that uh, vengeance belongeth to God. This is why it's very dangerous for a preacher, pastor, or lay person to take advantage utilizing religion, usually this would be done by a zur, an apostate, to, to rip them off for one way or the other. God takes their case. Why? Because you have an attorney sitting right at the right hand of God. You have an intercessor who is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he takes notes. Okay, And and he takes the cause of the poor when someone tries to oppress them. Uh, the poor may never know about it, but I guarantee you the person that oppressed them will. God will get their attention big time because he will not tolerate uh, those that oppress or, or bring um, sadness or hurt upon those that can't help themselves, those that are down and those that are out. Um, do not uh, try to pick on them. But why? Again, the Lord will plead their cause. And when you go against God, do you know what kind of a chance you have? You might think about it. Verse 24. 
make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go. In other words, um, um, this, this, this is somebody that is really a monster with anger. Just flies off at everything. Never has a peaceful moment. You, you, you don't need a friend like that. Okay. Because, why, well, why is that? Well, anger is a form of insanity. Okay. And uh, all of us have enough trouble with it because you will, you will cloud up and you will get angry and you will say things that you really didn't intend to say because it's a moment of, of basically bordering um, uh, insanity. Okay. But if you find somebody that is habitually angry, that means mad at the world, at God, at everything in it. There's just never a positive answer for anything. You got trouble and you sure do not want a friend like that. Because you, there will never be a friendship that will be of a, a friendship of equality, meaning um, uh, love, compassion, help, assistance. It'll always be trouble, upset, everything wrong. You know, you, you can be a good student of God's Word, and you, if you expose yourself too much to a person that's habitually angry or upset about everything, you're, gonna, you're not going to find happiness, okay? What is God telling you then? Life's too short to put up with that kind of stuff, okay? Do not pick a friend that cannot control their anger, okay? That is habitual about it, okay? About everything. 25. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. In other words, uh, sooner or later, he's going to include you in it. If he, in other words, how can you have a friend if he's angry at everything? Do you think he's not going to be angry at you too sooner or later? And boy, will it be severe. Okay, getting up and uh, getting even time. Okay, you cannot have a friend like that. That they're not capable of friendship. Uh, verse twenty-six: Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. In other words, um, you don't hastily want to stand good for somebody that uh, needs a, a signature before they can borrow something. Because you, might, you probably will get, if you do it anxiously, without taking the trouble to check it out, you're going to get hooked big time. Okay? You might as well go ahead and pay their debt for them because you're going to get hung. Okay? Um, Strike hands mean to shake hands or to be in agreement on something. Verse 27. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? In other words, if you sign that surety and you don't have anything to back that surety up for him other than your good name, they'll come and even take the bed that you sleep on right out from under you. So don't, don't do that. Don't sign a surety for something that, um, that you can't stand good for yourself or it will not only ruin that person, it will ruin you also. And, and God does not expect you to do that. Okay. Verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. This is extremely important. The travels of time. You know, a lot of people can't go back one generation in their family tree. Okay. And the very landmarks that our fathers set forth when Israel was taken captive over the Caucasus Mountains, and later they're called Caucasians, they settled Europe and then later migrated to these great United States of America, Canada, and um, they, they don't know who they are. Why? Because the landmarks are moved. The, the points of identity where a person knows who they are. And God's, God promised Israel will become as numerous as the stars of heaven. Then let me ask you a question. Where are they? And well, well they're, they're, it's the tribe of Judah. No, Judah is only one tribe. Judah is the house of Judah. The house of Israel is a totally different house. Not necessarily totally, but it is a different house. Why? Because they're divided now. The house of Israel and the house of Judah are separated. Okay. 
And we know where Judah is, basically, but we do not. Most people do not know where the house of Israel is, but you do. That's important. Why? Because you haven't moved the landmarks. And you know that God is a keeper of His Word. When He said, I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth, He meant it and He did it. But God blesses those people. And America, being the superpower of superpowers, has a large part of that house of Israel within it. It's blessed. It's not an accident. Why? Because we love the Father. And that's extremely important. Those landmarks are there. Those landmarks, the ancient ones, are still in place. Verse 29. And, and this, not only America, it's the free people of the world, the Christian nations of the world. Uh, verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? That means he's, he's, he's sharp. He thinks it through. Question. He shall, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Why? Well, he's too, he's too uh, sharp for it. He knows better. Okay, And um, a good businessman knows what he's doing. Uh, never, never, never go into business for a, or buy, purchase a business that you know nothing about or you will... Go to, you most likely go to the cleaners. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be diligent. And most of all, you have to know that your customers, when you're in, in the business of serving customers, they've got to be served. And if you can't provide service, you're going to fail. Okay. A, a business that is successful must provide service. Or people are going somewhere else. So uh, that's not a diligent business. These things that are the cries for wisdom, she's speaking to you. And this, this uh, personal character, yours, will continue through the next chapter, basically. So don't miss it. Our Father's good to us when He allows wisdom to speak. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, My little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it with us. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, a religion, a denomination, or organization. Let's don't judge people. You know, you teach God's Word and let the chips fall wherever they may. You'll be doing real good. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, again, always good to hear from you. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're even thinking now. You don't even have to say it out loud. What He wants from you is your love. He loves you. He may not love what you're doing all the time, but He does love you. And he wants you to return that love. You do it. You hear? You do it. Now, Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Sandy from North Carolina. The current events of...
The separation of the children and mothers of the people in Texas upsets me. I can't believe that in the United States of America you can have children ripped from you like that. There may have been illegal or other things done. However, are we not supposed to have a due process question? Absolutely. I know we are not told everything, but uh, taking an infant from his, its mother that is not uh, harm, harming, it seems like an abuse by, of law. If they are found wrong, then punish them. But I would want my day in court first. Sandy from North Carolina. Well, I agree with you, Sandy, uh, especially in as much as this has been documented that the call of abuse came from an insane person, or at least a very confused person that was even in Colorado, not Texas, that caused the families to be arrested. There were many families that had single parents. By that I mean one, one wife, one husband, and their own children. And here in the United States of America, if that be the case, you do not lawfully take that child away from those two people. And uh, this happened in more than one uh, a, a case in this situation. So there have been some bad wrongs. And uh, many people say, well, there were children being molested. Prove it. They haven't. The state of Texas hasn't proved it. Um, I, I can't say that that's my cup of tea, certainly. But at the same time, we have certain rights in this nation, and things could have done been done a lot more uh, with compassion. Uh, there were a lot of, of small babies that were ripped away from their mothers, some of them even handicapped. And you think that didn't uh, harm those children? Of course it did. It was the state of Texas that abused children. Um, and listen to an insane woman making a complaint. It could have been done a lot better. I'm not saying that they're totally wrong. I'm just saying they weren't very wise in what they did, in the way they did what they did. Uh, God knows. God will work it all out. Serena from um, Chicago, from Illinois. My question is, on the sixth and seventh trump, will we hear a sound that we may count by? Uh, please explain. No, you probably won't hear a sound, but if you know what happens on the sixth trump when it comes to pass, that that's Antichrist appears on earth, that's six, the sixth trump, the sixth vial, and the sixth seal, six, six, six. You can't go wrong on that. You don't need a sound. You know by the very facts that it's happening. And how do you know when the seventh trump sounds? That's when the true Christ returns, and not until. So then when the true Christ returns and um, we're changed instantly into spiritual bodies, that's the seventh trump. You don't need to hear a sound. That's it. Caroline from North Carolina. Can you explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17? Why does Thessalonians say we will be caught up together in the clouds? And Ezekiel, 13, Ezekiel chapter 13 Verses 20 through 22 say it's wrong to teach my people to fly away in the clouds. I hear many ministers preaching on the belief of Thessalonians. Uh, I, I believe you teach the correct way. Well, thank you. I, uh, most people, when they study for, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, they don't go to the 13th verse. Therefore, they miss the whole subject because the subject is laid out in the 13th verse, where Paul states, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are as to where the dead are, or those asleep in Christ. If, here's the condition, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, and you either do that or you're not a Christian, okay, you know Christ resurrected or you're not a Christian, okay, then it says, those also that are asleep in him have risen also. They're with him. They're already out of here. They're gone. They're already with him. And then it continues on. And the dead in Christ rise first. Of course they do. He just said it. They're gone. And at the seventh trump, yeah, we are caught up into the spiritual body. The word air, as it is utilized there, 
is the breath of life, meaning spirit, body. Uh, David from Georgia. And then again, I, I, I want to add a footnote. In chapter 13 of Ezekiel, God is very clear. He says, I'm against those that cover my saving arms where I have salvation worked out for the children and teach them to fly to save their soul, be raptured out. God doesn't like it. Okay. I'm against it, he says. David from Georgia, I know you don't answer questions about other specific religions. No, I don't judge people. But generally speaking, would it be at all profitable to go to classes taught by one of another faith in order to, to learn more about the, their beliefs? Or is there really no purpose for doing this or other than promoting unity among religions, which is really what uh, Antichrist will try to accomplish? Please explain. Well, I really can't answer that for you because as a student of God's Word and as a teacher of God's Word, I must understand many religions, okay? And I have studied many religions, not, as you say, not necessarily to whether I would go that way, but to know how to confront or to understand where they're coming from, okay? To know how to deal with the situation. Once you are solid in the Word of God, and you let God be supreme. You can read or study whatever you want to, but it's according to how strong you are and how God leads you that you have to follow that remark. There will never be unity until we come to the place where they almost have unity and then it receives the deadly wound and the Antichrist appears. He'll get them together, but you don't want to be in that crowd other than to witness against him. Carol from Michigan. If Antichrist can't change us into our spiritual bodies to rapture us up and out, how can people follow him if they believe in the rapture and it doesn't happen? Help me understand. Well, what does it say in Mark 13 that he's going to say? That he is going to appear and mother is going to turn against daughter and father against son. Why? He's saying because we will be delivered up for a testimony, but his word will be, go bring your kin folks that don't believe as you do and let's convert them. Okay. And then we'll gather out of here, but let's save your loved ones first. And mothers will betray a daughter that way up to death. Who is death? Satan. Okay. The Antichrist. Uh, and um, that's who, the, thinking he is Jesus, that mother will say, my daughter's a good girl, don't you judge her. I'm going to bring her up and you talk to her. So they're turned in by their own parents and, and uh, kin and friends. So, and, and that's how it is. That's why that they will believe. They're helping people, okay? They're helping people worship Satan. Only they think they're doing what's right. That's why it will happen as it d does. Um, Neva from Massachusetts. I'm very thankful for your wonderful, well, thank you. Um, I'm glad you've been with us nine years. Thank you. What do I say to those who quote Acts chapter 10 as giving people permission to eat pork products? <clears throat> Can you provide any clarifying scripture? Well, Acts chapter 10 verse 28 explains the whole thing. In the 28th verse, Peter knows of a certainty he wasn't talking about food. He was talking about Gentiles. You will not call them common. It has nothing to do with food. God took those uh, sheets right back up to heaven. He wouldn't let Peter partake of those. And the main thing you want to remember is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, where you don't let anyone judge you in marriage and you don't let anyone judge you in food that God created to be received. God didn't create all things to be received. And don't ever let anyone tell you different, because it, it, it will, um, it's very unhealthy not to, God created these flesh bodies. He knows what it takes to keep them pretty healthy. And, and if you want to keep them that way, you need to do it his way. He sent you the letter on how to cut it, okay? Okay, Brad from Tennessee. Um, and um, I have, I live in East Tennessee. Do you have a, 
work about the local Indians. I have heard of the Bat Creek Stone, and I thought I had heard you talk about uh, sun gods. Tell me more. Well, Sun Gods was written by a, a, a very good friend of mine, now deceased, uh, Professor Joseph Mahon. And he traced um, the tribes of the Cherokee and others from, um, from uh, uh, Iran and other countries uh, to this nation, uh, what their beliefs were, their, who they worship, Yahweh, and uh, so forth. And um, these sun gods are the Uchis, which really you will find many of them among the five civilized tribes. And the Cherokee Nation, which started there in Loudoun County, Tennessee, or in that general area, a large part of it, it is here is where the famous Bat Creek Stone was found. And, and I have to say, and I'm, I, I'm kind of going to be, a lot of people are going to think, well, he's bragging. No, I'm not bragging. It just so happens that priest, nine priests were found in that grave. And they had written on this stone. And I guarantee you, you would have to be a student, a priest of God's word and know and understand the Mothra, or you could not interpret that stone. I happen to be a student of the Mothra and of God's word, and I can and did interpret that stone. Uh, and these priests stated, and I'm going to go by memory now, it's been many years since I've been there, but I've been in Loudoun County, Tennessee, it's a beautiful place, and um, how fantastic. But it said, let the lion of the tribe of Judah's voice be the poker that draws these firebrands, meaning those priests, back to him. And uh, there is a Masoretic note, and that wires all of it together. Without that, that's why that the linguists have much difficulty with it. Um, and uh, but uh, being a, a, a student of God's word, as those priests were, it's simple, very simple. So it, it's not. I'm, I'm certainly not bragging, because it's that simple that a child could do it that had that knowledge. Geraldine from Illinois, Pastor Murray, what is the what is a simple prayer for someone with epilepsy uh, to ask God for salvation? Something easy for her to remember and retain? Thank you. Just tell her to love him and talk to him. You, you don't want to write something down. Just say, Father, I, want, I, I seek your salvation and, and I love you. That's, it's that simple and that's all there is to it in this case. Okay, And tell her just to talk to him. And, and uh, ask it naturally in the name of Jesus Christ. Always pray, have, teach her to pray to God, but ask in the name of Jesus. Why? Because that documents that she's a believer. Okay, And uh, that gets God's attention. Uh, don't make it complicated. Just talk. Okay, uh, Linda from Ohio. Where do demons come from? Actually, you know, the word demons is not in God's manuscripts, basically. Um, where it reports demons, it's evil spirits, okay, or familiar spirits. And uh, they come from, well, uh, Satan is um, the lunatic spirit, okay, that Christ spoke of. And there are many evil spirits, uh, but there are also the Holy Spirit. And everyone has a spirit. And what you do with your spirit basically describes your character for it's your intellect. Okay. In other words, with my spirit, I study and I teach. And that sp my spirit through that word or teaching that word goes out to many places. But that's a spirit. And so there's nothing that... to um, um, unusual about even evil spirits because there are evil spirits in the world. But God gave us power and authority over them and in Christ's name uh, we control. Okay, Beverly from Washington. Where in the Bible does it say we'll see our relatives and loved ones in heaven? It states it in the millennium chapters of the book of Ezekiel. I think I'm asked this question more than any other question. 
In Ezekiel 44, it states that if you are one of God's elect, that means a Zadok, then you can uh, go to a loved one, um, brother, sister, mother, father, a sister unmarried, I should say, uh, quoting properly. In Ezekiel 44, you can go there and help them during the millennium period if they're not coming around real good to suit you. And um, so naturally you would have to recognize them or you wouldn't know they needed help in the first place. Uh, uh, Richard from, uh, Earl from um, Michigan. My question is concerning the day of judgment. If some go to the other side of the Gulf when they die, would not the day of judgment better be referred to as the day of sentencing since they have basically already been judged? No, no, you're leaving out the millennium, um, Earl. In other words, there are some of these people that didn't make the first resurrection that never had a chance. They were never taught the truth. And, and there are some, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, that God himself sent the spirit of slumber on so they would not be accountable. Like not, probably knowing they would fall right at Satan's lap. Okay. But um, we have the millennium and the second resurrection, as it's written in Revelation chapter 20, and then the judgment. But it's not all, it is for sentencing, but I'm looking forward to receiving my sentence. It's a blessing. It's payday. And it's going to be great, good things, uh, hopefully, um, for having taught his word and for, uh, uh, for loving him. And hopefully the same for everybody else. Every time you repent, the bad is erased out of the book of life, and you're not judged for that. But the good things are always there, and that's where your blessings come from. But you're missing the millennium where God loves his children that never had a chance. Ron from New Jersey, what does the mark of the beast in the hand mean? Well, what, it's in the right hand. What do you do with your right hand? You do the work, meaning... Some of them are even going to be working Satan's church, working for him. It is the equivalent of Mark 13 where it says, Many will be with child, woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. Meaning, woe to those that are spiritually impregnated by the Antichrist and nurse along his work even. Okay, the same equivalent. Um, Sandra from Louisiana. Sandra... Um, diabetic, I believe. And you're handicapped. And you, when, when, in Proverbs, when it speaks of a lazy person, it's not talking about you, darling. Okay? Not talking about you at all. Don't you feel guilty because you're not able to work? Okay? You take that that uh, is given you and um, you enjoy life as best you can. And uh, don't let some, anyone put you on a guilt trip. Um, and no one understand God um, is with you. You have nothing to answer for. You're in good shape, okay? God does not consider you to be a lazy person. What, your last years of work, I'm sure you had pain that no one can imagine. And not like somebody would work and feel pretty good and go home rested, get rest. But it was painful. So you you done good. So don't you feel God loves you and let that be. Mike from Kentucky. If I die before the millennium and the Lord thinks I still need some work, will, will he put me on the other side of the gulf to give me some help? Well, I, I think you're probably doing pretty good, okay? I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. I've never molested a child. Well, I, I think, you know, God... Uh, Mike is a God of love. He, he loves his children. He doesn't wake up every morning and say, who am I going to find a zap today? You know, He's not looking for that. He loves you. So I, I'm thinking that you are a little bit up to time. Let him know you love him. okay? And um, you have nothing to be ashamed of and repent for any sin you might have done and ease your pack down and take five rest a while. okay? You're in good shape. Um, Frank from uh, Frank and Andrea from Pennsylvania. Question: Was Ham's wife a Kenite? No, 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 no. And I see that you've been with us for ten the last ten years. Okay. 
um, uh, no, your documentation that Ham's wife was not a Kenite, you will find in um, Genesis chapter 6 where it states you know, along about verse 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7 that all of, family, all of Noah's family was perfect. All his generations were perfect. The word generation means his, gene his genealogy, meaning his pedigree in the Hebrew tongue. It was perfect. His whole family, his sons, their wives, and Noah's wife, all were uh, qualified and acceptable to God to bring forth the Christ child. Okay, That was the whole point. But then, see, he told Noah in that same sixth chapter, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. And if you're trying to find how the Kenites made it through the flood, they were flesh. And they took two aboard the ark. Okay, God preserved them. And two of every flesh, that means all races were taken aboard. Uh, Kathleen from Maine. Pastor Murray, I'm 13 years old. My brother Cameron and I are still watching your Bible lesson. I love your teaching. Well, thank you. My dad and a brother and I watch your lessons, but my mom doesn't believe in God. I have asked her to join us in watching, but she um, doesn't. Uh, well, you, you're, you're doing good, and you don't have to totally withdraw. You, you just uh, keep setting that good example and I'm so very proud of you, but I'm also out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it, okay? You know what? It makes His day. And when you make His day, He's certainly going to make yours, all right? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, blessing God, again, He always blesses you. Now, most important, hey, you listen to me good. You stay in His Word every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.